Chapter 9 of The Flying Inn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole K. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 9 the Higher Criticism and Mr. Hibbs. Pebblewick boasted an enterprising evening paper of its own, called the Pebblewick Globe, and it was the great vaunt of the editor's life that he had got out an edition announcing the mystery of the vanishing signboard, almost simultaneously with its vanishing. In the rows that followed, sandwich men found no little protection from the blows indiscriminately given them behind and before, in the large wooden boards they carried, inscribed, The Vanishing Pub, Pebblewick's Fairy Tale Special. And the paper contained a categorical and mainly correct account of what had happened, or what seemed to to have happened, to the eyes of the amazed George and his crowd of sympathizers. George Byrne, carpenter of this town, with Samuel Gripes, drayman in the service of Messrs. J. and Gubbins, brewers, together with a number of other well-known residents, passed by the new building erected on the West Beach for various forms of entertainment and popularly called the Small Universal Hall. Seeing outside it one of the old inn signs now so rare, they drew the quite proper inference that the place retained the license to sell alcoholic liquors, which so many other places in this neighborhood have recently lost. The persons inside, however, appear to have denied all knowledge of the fact, and when the party, after some regrettable scenes in which no life was lost, came out on the beach again, it was found that the inn sign had been destroyed or stolen. All parties were quite sober and had indeed obtained no opportunity to be anything else. The mystery is underlying inquiry. But this comparatively realistic record was local and spontaneous, and owed not a little to the accidental honesty of the editor. Moreover, evening papers are often more honest than morning papers, because they are written by ill-paid and hard-worked underlings in a great hurry, and there is no time for more timid people to correct them. By the time the morning papers came out next day, a faint but perceptible change had passed over the story of the vanishing signboard. In the daily paper, which had the largest circulation and the most influence in that part of the world, the problem was committed to a gentleman known by what seemed to the non-journalistic world the singular name of Hibbs However. It had been affixed to him in jest, in connection with the almost complicated caution with which all his public criticisms were qualified at every turn, so that everything came to depend upon the conjunctions, upon but, and yet, and though, and similar words. As his salary grew larger, for editors and proprietors like that sort of thing, and his old friends fewer, for the most generous of friends cannot but feel faintly acid at a success which has in it nothing of the infectious flavor of glory, he grew more and more to value himself as a diplomatist, a man who always said the right thing. But he was not without his intellectual nemesis, for at last he became so very diplomatic as to be darkly and densely unintelligible. People who knew him had no difficulty in believing that what he had said was the right thing, the tactful thing, the thing that should save the situation. But they had great difficulty in discovering what it was. In his early days he had had a great talent for one of the worst tricks of modern journalism, the trick of dismissing the important part of a question, and appearing to get to business on the unimportant part of it. Thus he would say, 
Whatever we may think of the rights and wrongs of the vivisection of pauper children, we shall all agree that it should only be done in any event by fully qualified practitioners. But in the later and darker days of his diplomacy, he seemed rather to dismiss the important part of a subject and get to grips with some totally different subject, following some timid and elusive train of associations of his own. In his late bad manner, as they say of painters, he was just as likely to say, whatever we may think of the rights and wrongs of the vivisection of pauper children, no progressive mind can doubt that the influence of the Vatican is on the decline. His nickname had stuck to him in honor of a paragraph he was alleged to have written when the American president was wounded by a bullet fired by a lunatic in New Orleans, and which was said to have run, The president passed a good night, and his condition is greatly improved. The assassin is not, however, a German, as was at first supposed. Men stared at that mysterious conjunction till they wanted to go mad, and to shoot somebody themselves. Hibbs, however, was a long, lank man, with straight yellowish hair, and a manner that was externally soft and mild, but secretly supercilious. He had been, when at Cambridge, a friend of Levison, and they had both prided themselves on being moderate politicians. But if you have had your hat smashed over your nose by one who has very recently described himself as a law-abiding man, and if you have had to run for your life with one coat-tail, and encouraged to further bodily activity by having irregular pieces of a corrugated iron roof thrown after you by men more energetic than yourself, you will find you emerge with emotions which are not solely those of a moderate politician." Hibbs, however, had already composed a leaderette on the Pebblewick incident, which rather pointed to the truth of the story, so far as his articles ever pointed to anything. His motives for veering vaguely in this direction were, as usual, complex. He knew the millionaire who owned the paper had a hobby of spiritualism, and something might always come out of not suppressing a marvellous story. He knew that two, at least, of the prosperous artisans or small tradesmen who had attested the tale were staunch supporters of the party. He knew that Lord Ivywood must be mildly but not effectually checked, for Lord Ivywood was of the other party, and there could be no milder or less effectual way of checking him than by allowing the paper to lend at least a temporary credit to a well-supported story that came from outside, and certainly had not been, like so many stories, created in the office. Amid all these considerations had Hibbs, however, steered his way to a more or less confirmatory article, when the sudden apparition of J. Levison's secretary in the sub-editor's room with a burst collar and broken eyeglasses led Mr. Hibbs into a long private conversation with him and a comparative reversal of his plans. But of course he did not write a new article. He was not of that divine order who make all things new. He chopped and changed his original article in such a way that it was something quite beyond the most bewildering article he had written in the past, and is still prized by those highly cultured persons who collect the worst literature of the world. It began, indeed, with the comparatively familiar formula, whether we take the more lax or the more advanced view of the old disputed problem of the morality or immorality of the wooden signboard as such, we shall all agree that the scenes enacted at Pebblewick were very discreditable to most, though not all, concerned. After that, tact degenerated into a riot of irrelevance. It was a wonderful article. The reader could get from it a faint glimpse of Mr. Hibbs's opinion on almost every other subject except the subject of the article. The first half of the next sentence made it quite clear that Mr. Hibbs, had he been present, would not have lent his active assistance to the massacre of St. Bartholomew or the massacres of September. 
but the second half of the sentence suggested with equal clearness that since these two acts were no longer as it were in contemplation and all attempts to prevent them would probably arrive a little late he felt the warmest friendship for the french nation he merely insisted that his friendship should never be mentioned except in the french language it must be called an entente in the language taught to tourists by waiters it must on no account be called an understanding in a language understand it of the people from the first half of the sentence following it might safely be inferred that mr hibbs had read milton or at least the passage about sons of belial from the second half that he knew nothing about bad wine let alone good the next sentence began with the corruption of the roman empire and contrived to end with dr clifford then there was a weak plea for eugenics and a warm plea against conscription which was not true eugenics that was all and it was headed the riot at pebblewick yet some injustice would be done to hibbs however if we concealed the fact that this chaotic leader was followed by a quite a considerable mass of public correspondence the people who write to newspapers are it may be supposed a small eccentric body like most of those that sway a modern state but at least unlike the lawyers or the financiers or the members of parliament or the men of science they are people of all kinds scattered all over the country of all classes counties ages sects sexes and stages of insanity the letters that followed hibbs's article are still worth looking up in the dusty old files of his paper a dear old lady in the densest part of the midlands wrote to suggest that there might really have been an old ship wrecked on the shore during the proceedings mr levison may have omitted to notice it or at that late hour of the evening it may have been mistaken for a signboard especially by a person of defective sight my own sight has been failing for some time and i am still a diligent reader of your paper if mr hibbs's diplomacy had left one nerve in his soul undrugged he would have laughed or burst into tears or got drunk or gone into a monastery over a letter like that as it was he measured it with a pencil and decided that it was just too long to get into the column then there was a letter from a theorist and a theorist of the worst sort there is no great harm in the theorist who makes up a new theory to fit a new event but the theorist who starts with a false theory and then sees everything as making it come true is the most dangerous enemy of human reason the letter began like a bullet let loose by the trigger is not the whole question met by exodus four three i enclose pamphlets in which i have proved the point quite plainly and which none of the bishops or the so-called free church ministers have attempted to answer the connection between the rod or pole and the snake so clearly indicated in scripture is no less clear in this case it is well known that those who follow after strong drink often announce themselves as having seen a snake is it not clear that those unhappy revelers beheld it in its transformed state as a pole see also deuteronomy eighteen two if our so-called religious leaders etc the letter went on for thirty-three pages and hibbs was perhaps justified in this case in thinking the letter rather too long then there was the scientific correspondent who said might it not be due to the acoustic qualities of the hall he had never believed in the corrugated iron hall the very word hall itself he added playfully was often so sharpened and shortened by the abrupt echoes of those repeated metallic curves that it had every appearance of being the word hell and had caused many theological entanglements and some police prosecutions in the light of these facts he wished to draw the editor's attention to some very curious details about this supposed presence or absence of an inn sign 
it would be noted that many of the witnesses and especially the most respectable of them constantly refer to something that is supposed to be outside the word outside occurs at least five times in the depositions of the complaining persons surely by all scientific analogy we may infer that the unusual phrase in sign is an acoustic error for inside the word inside would so naturally occur in any discussion either about the building or the individual when the debate was of a hygienic character this letter was signed medical student and the less intelligent parts of it were selected for publication in the paper then there was a really humorous man who wrote and said there was nothing at all inexplicable or unusual about the case he himself he said had often seen a signboard outside a pub when he went into it and been quite unable to see it when he came out this letter the only one that had any quality of literature was sternly set aside by mr hibbs then came a cultured gentleman with a light touch who merely made a suggestion had anyone read h g wells's story about the kink in space he contrived indescribably to suggest that no one had even heard of it except himself or perhaps of mr wells either the story indicated that men's feet might be in one part of the world and their eyes in another he offered the suggestion for what it was worth the particular pile of letters on which hibbs however threw it showed only too clearly what it was worth then there was a man of course who called it all a plot of frenzied foreigners against britain's shore but as he did not make it quite clear whether the chief wickedness of these aliens had lain in sticking the sign up or in pulling it down his remarks the remainder of which referred exclusively to the conversational misconduct of an italian ice-cream man whose side of the case seemed insufficiently represented carried the less weight and then last but the reverse of least there plunged in all the people who think they can solve a problem they cannot understand by abolishing everything that has contributed to it we all know these people if a barber has cut his customer's throat because the girl has changed her partner for a dance or donkey ride on hampstead heath there are always people to protest against the mere institutions that led up to it this would not have happened if barbers were abolished or if cutlery were abolished or if the objection felt by girls to imperfectly grown beards were abolished or if the girls were abolished or if heaths and open spaces were abolished or if dancing were abolished or if donkeys were abolished but donkeys i fear will never be abolished there were plenty of such donkeys in the common land of this particular controversy some made it an argument against democracy because poor jarge was a carpenter some made it an argument against alien immigration because miss isra ammon was a turk some proposed that ladies should no longer be admitted to any lectures anywhere because they had constituted a slight and temporary difficulty at this one without the faintest fault of their own some urged that all holiday resorts should be abolished some urged that all holidays should be abolished some vaguely denounced the seaside some still more vaguely proposed to remove the sea all said that if this or that stones or seaweed or strange visitors or bad weather or bathing machines were swept away with a strong hand this which had happened would not have happened they only had one slight weakness all of them that they did not seem to have the faintest notion of what had happened and in this they were not inexcusable nobody did know what had happened nobody knows it to this day of course or it would be unnecessary to write this story no one can suppose this story is written from any motive save that of telling the plain humdrum truth that queer confused cunning which was the only definable quality possessed by hibbs however had certainly scored a victory so far for the tone of the weekly papers followed him with more intelligence and less trepidation but they followed him 
it seemed more and more clear that some kind of light and sceptical explanation was to be given of the whole business, and that the whole business was to be dropped. The story of the signboard and the ethical chapel of corrugated iron was discussed and somewhat disparaged in all the more serious and especially in the religious weeklies, though the low church papers seemed to reserve their distaste chiefly for the signboard and the high church papers chiefly for the chapel all agreed that the combination was incongruous and most treated it as fabulous the only intellectual organs which seemed to think it might have happened were the spiritualist papers and their interpretation had not that solidity which would have satisfied mr george it was not until almost a year after that it was felt in philosophical circles that the last word had been said on the matter an estimate of the incident and of its bearing on natural and supernatural history occurred in professor widge's celebrated historicity of the petropiscatorial phenomena which so profoundly affected modern thought when it came out in parts in the hibbert journal every one remembers professor widge's main contention that the modern critic must apply to the thaumaturgics of the lake of tiberius the same principle of criticism which dr bunk and others have so successfully applied to the thaumaturgics of the canaan narrative authorities as final as pink and tosher wrote the professor have now shown with an emphasis that no emancipated mind is entitled to question that the aquavinic thaumaturgy at cana is wholly inconsistent with the psychology of the master of the feast as modern research has analyzed it and indeed with the whole judeo-aramaic psychology at that stage of its development as well as being painfully incongruous with the elevated ideals of the ethical teacher in question but as we rise to higher levels of moral achievement it will probably be found necessary to apply the canaic principle to other and later events in the narrative this principle has of course been mainly expounded by husher in the sense that the whole episode is unhistorical while the alternative theory that the wine was non-alcoholic and was naturally infused into the water can claim on its side the impressive name of mins it is clear that if we apply the same alternative to the so-called miraculous draught of fishes we must either hold with gilp that the fishes were stuffed representations of fishes artificially placed in the lake see the rev y wise's christovegetarianism as a world system where this position is forcibly set forth or we must on the husherian hypothesis deprive the piscatorial narrative of all claim to historicity whatever the difficulty felt by the most daring critics even pook in adopting this entirely destructive attitude is the alleged improbability of so detailed a narrative being founded on so slight a phrase as the anti-historical critics refer it to it is urged by pook with characteristic relentless reasoning that according to husher's theory a metaphorical but at least noticeable remark such as i will make you fishers of men was expanded into a realistic chronicle of events which contains no mention even in the passages evidently interpolated of any men actually found in the nets when they were hauled up out of the sea or more properly lagoon it must appear presumptuous or even bad taste for any one in the modern world to differ on any subject from pook but i would venture to suggest that the very academic splendor and unique standing of the venerable professor whose ninety-seventh birthday was so beautifully celebrated in chicago last year may have forbidden him all but intuitive knowledge of how errors arise among the vulgar i crave pardon for mentioning a modern case known to myself not indeed by personal presence but by careful study of all the reports which presents a curious parallel to such ancient expansions of a text into an incident in accordance with husher's law it occurred at pebblewick in the south of england the town had long been in a state of dangerous religious excitement the great religious genius who has since so much altered our whole attitude to the religions of the world misisra ammon had been lecturing on the sands to thousands of enthusiastic hearers 
Their meetings were often interrupted, both by children's services run on the most ruthless lines of orthodoxy, and by the League of the Red Rosette, the formidable atheist and anarchist organization. As if this were not enough to swell the whirlpool of fanaticism, the old popular controversy between the Milnian and the complete sublapsarians broke out again on the fated beach. It is natural to conjecture that in the thickening atmosphere of theology in Pebblewick, some controversialist quoted the text, An evil and adulterous generation seek for a sign. But no sign shall be given it save the sign of the prophet Jonas. A mind like that of Pook will find it hard to credit, but it seems certain that the effect of this text on the ignorant peasantry of southern England was actually to make them go about looking for a sign, in the sense of those old tavern signs now so happily disappearing. The sign of the prophet Jonas they somehow translated in their stunted minds into a signboard of the ship out of which Jonah was thrown. They went about literally looking for the sign of the ship, and there are some cases of their suffering Smale's hallucination and actually seeing it. The whole incident is a curious parallel to the gospel narrative and a triumphant vindication of Husher's law. Lord Ivywood paid a public compliment to Professor Widge, saying that he had rolled back from his country what might have been an ocean of superstitions. But, indeed, poor Hibbs had struck the first and stunning blow that scattered the brains of all men. End of chapter 9 Recording by Nicole Kay